Uh, so, again, uh, thanks a lot for the introduction, and it is my great pleasure uh, to be able to talk to you about the work that has occupied me for the past five or so years. Uh, and it is focused on safety and robustness for deep learning, where the idea is to try to develop provable guarantees on the behavior of deep learning. So first of all, I think it is obvious to you all uh, that deep learning uh, is unstoppable. Uh, and uh, in fact, it is now being used almost everywhere. What many people do not realize is that the idea of neural networks is actually quite old. It goes back to the 1940s, uh, but it took uh, several decades for that technology to be developed into something that we can actually program and use within our computers. Um, but more, most recently, it has actually been recognized by really top awards in the field, in particular the Turing Award. So why now? Well, this is because we have GPUs now running in our laptops, so it's very easy uh, to build and train models. Uh, also, we have big data, a lot of uh, labeled data that can be used for supervised learning and inference uh, has become more and more efficient. So because of that, as I've already said, we have deep learning with everything. I'm giving you some examples here, face recognition, autonomous driving, also clinical applications. Uh, that are being developed and are beginning to be deployed in real applications. And the stakes are rising even higher. Uh, if you are uh, tracking uh, what Elon Musk is doing, he is now uh, developing brain-computer interfaces. Uh, and if you have then a neural network working within something like this, uh, Obviously, you need to pay attention to, to such developments. So the question that I'm asking is, should we worry about safety? And in fact, there was a paper that was published which said that we actually don't need to worry about safety in these kinds of uh, uh, recognition classification problems. So what I'm showing you here is an example. This is something that was developed by my student. This is an example of images. These are actually real dashboard camera images. Um, there was a challenge called the Nexa challenge, which challenged the community to develop a neural network, a neural network classifier that will classify these images into those which have a uh, traffic light. And then if they have the traffic light, whether that traffic light is red or green. So with my students software, what we were able to do is we were able to take uh, these um, uh, images and find the position in many cases, just one pixel. If you change one pixel and the traffic light was classified as red, okay, so imagine you are sitting in this autonomous car and obviously it's stopped, but if you have an adversary that can break into the uh, computing system of your car, just one change of the pixel to green will change the classification to green. Uh, so my work has been guided by the question, well, I think we should worry about safety, uh, but really what we need is we need methodologies to make sure that such behaviors cannot occur. 
Of course, I showed you an example which was a little bit artificial because it relied on uh, um, uh, the fact that someone has to break into the network of your autonomous car. But there are other examples. This is an example of a physical attack which has been demonstrated for Tesla through resilience testing. If you have a look at this digit three, you will see that the middle part is slightly elongated. Uh, and what happened is that this sign then was misread by the uh, neural network classifier in the, in the Tesla 85 miles per hour and caused sudden ac acceleration. Fortunately, this was in the car park, so it didn't cause uh, major problems. But of course, if you've been reading the news, you know that uh, um, uh, there have been fatal crashes. Uh, in one case, a Tesla crashed into a barrier that was put across the white lines. And in another case, uh, a, a passenger was killed by Uber. These two are different technologies. Tesla relies on ordinary cameras, so it's similar to uh, my students, you know, dashboard camera images. Um, Uber relies on LiDAR. So if you are developing machine learning solutions, you know, as an engineer in this kind of company might be well, but you know, I, I was told that with this method, I can train my neural network to have 99.9 .9 accuracy. So how is this kind of crash possible? And I will say a little bit more about this. But first of all, let me take you back to a few years ago, 2013, 2014. Um, it was already realized within the machine learning community that deep neural networks are unstable. Uh, they can be fooled um, and they are unstable to what is called an adversarial perturbation. If you take an input, in this case, the input is an image of a panda uh, and then add noise to the pixels of this input. Um, this could be white noise. In fact, I take the noise, but only uh, a small proportion of that. So to a human, once you've add this white noise to a human, this looks the same as a panda. But the neural network can um, differentiate between uh, these very small values and it will give you some random answer. So this notion of adversarial perturbations has then led to warnings about uh, security risks and also practical attacks and these attacks exist can be programmed depending on different assumptions whether they are white box or, or white box and these attacks are transferable between different architectures and they don't apply just to image classification uh, but also all the kinds of problems in your segmentation, post recognition, sentiment analysis, etc. So what can we do about this? So my research area focuses on software verification. So the idea is that if you develop a piece of software, uh, there is a little bit of, you know, a, a Java program there, uh, we can model that software as for example, a transition graph. Uh, you can extract these models from software. You can also develop these models uh, from legacy systems. You can annotate these models with various parameters, for example, timing parameters. You have where well, in the middle we have a, uh, an automaton. And now what I'm looking towards is developing models also for neural networks. So the idea of software verification is to first perform this rigorous process of modeling of, in this case, a software artifact in future, you know, also a neural network as an artifact. This is a rigorous mathematical abstraction. Um, uh, and then 
because it is a piece of software, you know what it's supposed to deliver. So there is a specification. Uh, you then want to be able to prove that that specification is satisfied. Uh, and we tend to do this by um, uh, 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 software model checkers. Uh, so these run proofs for finite uh, uh, combinations of uh, systems, but just by running software rather than doing proofs uh, 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 on, on the blackboard or a whiteboard. Uh, then what we also want to do is to synthesize a correct by construction model from the specific think about it as model optimization and the idea is that all these techniques are algorithmic and implemented in software uh, so this has been the object of study for me uh, for so about 15 years before i discovered about uh, machine learning and neural networks, and I became interested in studying them as well. But they are neural networks and machine learning in general are very different from conventional software. So programming uh, is, is an activity which is based on constructing a sequence of instruction using logic as decisions and conditions. On the other hand, machine learning is just a black box which has been trained in some obscure way. Um, uh, programming is, is not based on logic. It's not based on considering the different conditions and what to do for these conditions. It is based by pattern matching. Uh, and corner cases are not missed conditions, uh, but unseen examples. So, for example, in the test life, the Tesla has never seen an example of a barrier put across a white line. Okay, that's that's a corner case, uh, and that is a potential, uh, you know, flaw in the model. Data quality and data coverage is crucial, and accuracy can be misleading, as I will explain in a minute. So ML on top of that is also very difficult to even consider as an object for verification um, because the foundations are not, not well understood. And uh, I mean, there are loss functions, but there is a choice of loss functions. There are different kinds of optimizations that we use for training. And of course, scalability is an issue, uh, but this is not just about verification. Ideally, what we would like is you would also like to apply the correct by construction th synthesis to models and parameters, not just verification. So I'll say a little bit more. This will be an overview of a selection of uh, um, uh, works that uh, I have done with my group, and they are basically targeting robustness evaluation in terms of bounding outputs of probability values so that we have provable guarantees on their safety. And I will say also a bit more later about how we can extend this and why you might want to extend it to probabilistic concepts and interventional robustness. Okay, so this is just to fix um, this scene, we are talking about deep feed-forward neural networks. So they take as inputs points, this point here, the image of a car. We think about it as a 3D matrix of pixels. Uh, the neural network is arranged in, into layers. And when the answer is propagated to the end with something, um, um, like softbox, it chooses the most likely label. I here I will focus on classifiers, and the problem uh, that I'm focusing on specifically is the following. I'm going to have a number of vector spaces, one for each layer. Notice that I've started off with a 3D 
um, matrix of pixels. So it was a 3D discrete matrix, but all the machine learning methods for neural networks assume that you map those to floating point values between zero and one, and we work with vector spaces. Now, I also have assume, I focus on classifier, I assume I have the ideal specification, which is the human perception ability. Uh, and what my neural network is, I'm using supervised learning, what my neural network is, the small f, is a mapping which is learned and represented by these learnable weights and bias, um, the weights and bias that live in each layer, uh, and it is learned from M training examples of an image and a class. Uh, so when I uh, take my little f, the neural network, give it an input, what I get is an output and the output is a class. So that's my problem setting. Now, when we train neural network uh, models, we train them from finitely uh, many points. But if you think of uh, the example of the 3D image of a car, which I have now mapped into uh, real values between zero and one, I have infinitely uncountably many points. I'm showing you an example of training a classifier uh, based on finitely many data. On the left, I have the blue crosses and then the, uh, the red dots. The task decision boundary is shown in a dotted line because in many cases we don't even know it. Model decision boundary is what the model learns and will depend on the choice of the training data. So once we've trained, we then test under the assumption it's not often not very explicit. The assumption is that the test data has to follow the same distribution as the training data. And the test data is shown in, in the darker blue crosses. And the accuracy is just the number of correct answers that my model gives on, that, on those test data. Notice finitely many, but there are possibly infinitely, infinitely many inputs. And I don't even know the precise boundaries. What the darker red crosses show is how easy it is to manipulate this model. And this is what adversarial perturbations do. They tend to start with a test data point, and then you use optimization to get close to the decision boundary where we know that problems will be, there may be weaknesses, or you get in between two data points hoping that there will be a, a point that has not been included in there and it demonstrates the weakness. So this is training and testing. That's how neural networks are developed. I will try to explain what my work is uh, aiming to do. Okay, but what about robustness? In the machine learning community, there is a common smoothness assumption. So when you train networks tend to use regular, regularization, etc. So that when you are, are focusing on a point, there is some small region around that point, such that all points in that region will classify the same. Uh, and this is this was called pointwise robustness in the original paper by Christian Segadi. Uh, so in order to show that the network is not robust, okay, to show an adversarial attack, all you need to do is to find a point in that region that's classified as something different. Um, so that's pointwise local robustness. You can formulate global robustness by taking the expectation over the input distribution. That's not the worst case, that's just the expectation. Uh, and there is more uh, more and more work in that uh, direction uh, developing within the machine learning community and also within the verification community with, with my community. So uh, what I'm focusing on is I'm focusing on 
safety of classification decisions. This is a very simple notion uh, to start with. And I view, I basically adapt the uh, point-wise robustness concept. So if you have a decision, you know, there will be a, some sort of critical point, for example, you know, a red traffic light image. So that's this point X. Uh, and to uh, uh, guarantee the safety of that classic uh, of that classification decision, I assume that there is a region eta around there. And what I then want to prove, okay, I want to prove uh, invariance stability of the classification decision over that uh, region eta. So if I find a point which is classified as something different, then uh, uh, this is not robust, it's not safe. So think about it again as the Tesla image with the uh, uh, barriers across the, uh, the white lines. Uh, but here, what I'm al already making a number of assumptions, and these would be provided by, you know, whoever is developing the model. So I'm assuming the, the network is already trained, so I'm not focusing on learning robustness, I'm focusing on checking robust, evaluating robustness of trained networks. Someone gives me the diameter, and also someone gives me the norm. Now, for image classifiers, what you really need is an image similarity metric, uh, but we tend to work with LP norms, L infinity norm, for example, but they are just proxies. Uh, they are not really good for human uh, perception. Um, uh, and the diameter has to be small, because if it is too wide, it can overlap another class. But more generally, what you want to do here is to show uh, invariance, not just for a single classification decision, but really for a group of manipulations, operations, just think of scratches, weather conditions, etc. Okay, so this is the picture of what I'm trying to do, as opposed to just showing you, say, the tests on these individual dark blue crosses. I'm trying to find regions and a covering, hopefully even a covering of the uh, of the model, but here I'm just showing it, it's just focusing on the critical decisions such that in the green area there are no adversarial examples. Um, okay. Uh, and what, how do I do this? So in the very first approach, uh, what we realized that if you focus, you know, on an in, on, on the region eta, but you assume, which is, I think, uh, quite common to assume that the functions uh, that you get from the neural network are lip sheets, then you can discretize that region, discretize that region into a finite grid. And this way you can reduce the search through an infinite region to the search through the corners of the finite grid. And that's the kind of property that I have relied on in my work, but more, it is also possible to use techniques like convex relaxation, constraint solving, etc. You may be familiar with integral band propagation, which we have also utilized in later work. Now, in this very first work, this was just a proof of concept. In fact, we used SMT, but we used SMT as a counting problem. So we counted the number of misclassifications that you get on the corners of the grid. And if it's zero, you are fine. You've, uh, you've proved the uh, um, uh, safety of the network. Now, this verification work is significantly different from heuristic search for adversarial examples, because if I haven't found an example, I can deduce it is safe. But for any heuristic search, if you haven't found it, you cannot deduce that. 
but scalability remains an issue. Okay, so what, what can we do? Okay, I mean, I'm focusing on classifiers and I use uh, as examples images, uh, but images lead to very high dimensional neural networks. This is a, a you know, a high resolution image. How can we, in that image, look for the position of that single pixel that you know, if you if you change the single pixel, it will change the classification decision. So the uh, uh, techniques, some of the techniques uh, actually come from uh, computer graphics. Uh, and in this case, what we are trying to do is we are trying to focus on features in the image uh, and use a pre-processing technique that will extract the features, the salient features, the importance and the position. Uh, and there is a method that uh, is well known in computer graphics, it's called SIFT, it will produce a list of features. So what I'm doing here is I have an image, I have a network, trained network. Uh, uh, I pre-process that image and I build a, uh, an auxiliary intermediate representation of that image based just which encodes just the features um, as a Gaussian mixture model. So I use the information about the strength of the features and, and they position the Gaussian mixture model. And I use that information to later guide the search. So notice, rather than looking in a, a very high dimensional space of pixels, I can guide it by um, uh, according to the uh, strength of the feature. So my search is more effective. Uh, what I also rely on is the lip sheets, the lip sheets condition. So I assume that my networks are lip sheets. What I also need is I need an estimate, I need an upper bound on the Lipschitz constant, which is uh, very uh, complex to compute, but there are more and more techniques that can be applied to the smaller networks. Um, and then uh, in order to search fast for adversarial examples, think about it as a way of testing that your neural network is, uh, you know, safety testing of your neural network, um, but also as a way to verify the safety of your neural network to some extent. Um, um, set up a game, uh, and the idea of this game is that it has two players, and the goal is finding for testing is finding an adversarial example, and the reward in the game is the inverse of the distance. This is because the smaller the distance to the original decision the worse the adversarial example, the more catastrophic, you know, change uh, can be if the decision is affected by this very small perturbation. Now, player one is guided by this mixture of Gaussian representation, and it will uh, select a feature, uh, and player two within that feature will select a pixel to manipulate. Uh, now, this method can be developed in a completely black box fashion. That is, I don't need to know, I just assume the network is trained, but I don't need to know anything about the weights. And it can be used to approximate the maximum safe radius. So this is the maximum radius around the point X, such that within that radius, 
uh, there are no adversarial examples. Now, this problem for high dimensional and complex networks is not feasible, but in many cases, it is good enough just to bound this maximal safe radius in terms of an upper bound, which I obtained by Monte Carlo tree search because any adversarial example gives me an upper bound and I use variants of A star search to approximate the lower bound. So this is the basic of the method and to show you that's how it works. So if you have an image of this missed image seven, uh, uh, you know, player one selects a feature within the image and player two then selects a pixel within that feature. And I'm showing you a sequence of manipulations with these added pixels until the one in red is shown to be an adversarial example. Um, now what uh, you can also show, and this is uh, using the German traffic science benchmark example, you can show that if you compute an upper bound of the MSR by searching for better and better adversarial examples and also running A star search through more and more iterations, uh, these two will converge. Well, in fact, the distance is not as small there because note that I have different, different scales. But the examples of images at the top are adversarial, the images at the bottom are actually safe. And the image just shows you, you know, how, uh, how fine the, the differences are. Um, MSR can be computed uh, not just for images. We have also done it for videos uh, where the networks are actually convolutional networks with RNNs. So you, you use convolutions to extract the features and RNNs to process the frames. Uh, but the perturbations here are not perturbations of pixels, you know, of the original features. The per perturbations are at the level of optical flows, and these are the changes to the features in between the, the different frames. But you can see again, safe and unsafe perturbations and the, the bounds converge. So you can use this, for example, to show that the video is not susceptible to uh, distortions such as brightness change or maybe angular rotation. Now, beyond images, uh, we have also developed this technique for uh, text classification. So with text, the idea is that you represent text in terms of embedding spaces. So like pixels, you also reduce them, but every word is reduced to a vector of real values in this case. And we work uh, through uh, word substitution or word deletion and the dangerous substitutions are the ones with synonyms. Uh, the examples here show you some in red is an in grammatically inconsistent replacement, but in green is a plausible replacement, so a plausible attack. But I can also show you that in some cases uh, for the given vocabulary and the model, it was not possible to find a replacement that could be used to attack the model. And this can be then used to actually produce certification guarantees. Certification guarantees here show you that for some words, it is not possible to find a replacement that would change the classification uh, of the um, uh, of of the network. Okay, and just to summarize what uh, we have managed to do with this technique. So taking you 
back to the next uh, challenge, and this is the um, um, example of dashboard camera images, and this is the award winning network something of found the, on the web. network ox.ac.uk. As an illustration, Alexa, let us stop. Think. Sorry, apologies. Um, uh, right, so what we were able to show with this, okay, and I'm playing around with the assumptions of training and testing, so, <laughs> so pay attention. Uh, what we were able to do is to take a test data set for every image in that test data set, so the training uh, accuracy was 95%, okay? But for each point in a test data set, on average in less than a second, and on average again, up to th about three pixel changes were enough to reduce the accuracy of the network from 95% to 0%, okay? I've played around with the distribution uh, but I wonder how many engineers who are developing this kind of software are actually aware of that hidden assumption. So that's um, the point, but I think now I come to questioning, well, you know, this was the starting example. I'm focused on safety and just safety of individual decisions, but how good are actually these MSR guarantees? On the one hand, they, you know, can be shown that they do the job. They are, the good point is that they are model agnostic. They can be configured with different norms and metrics, and they are also applicable both to continuous spaces like embedding spaces and also discrete search spaces. But the Worst case, local robustness in the region around the input is really too limiting, and we need to consider robustness to more complex properties, and in particular interventions, uh, and I'll say something about that. And in fact, also deterministic guarantees are too strict. So I assume that I take a trained network but we know that every time you train the network starting with a different seed, you get a slightly different network. So ideally what we need to do is we need to be able to quantify the, the uh, guarantees probabilistically. And I will say, you know, uh, something about that direction as well. So I think I'll probably uh, take the opportunity now to relay uh, a couple of questions uh, uh, okay. related to the material. Okay, these are from uh, uh, Rene Vidal. So two questions, in fact. So the first one is uh, a remark, uh, and it reads: uh, "I'm not sure uh, I agree with the contrast that programming and verification are based on rigorous theory logic, while deep learning is based on black box training and purely heuristic procedures." DL requires uh, programming, which follows a logical procedure. Moreover, what is programmed is based on principles from statistical learning theory, combining optimization and statistics. Uh, so there are many heuristics that are used during training, but I would argue heuristics are used in programming too. Uh, the key difference is that classical verification tools are not quite directly applicable to deep networks, primarily due to reasons of scale, and the fact that verification method needs to be adapted to be consistent with training procedures. So that's one comment. So uh, not sure. I actually agree with uh, these points. Uh, I, I am aware that in machine learning, uh, there is, a, in particular statistical learning, there is a lot of theory and theoretical guarantees have been developed. However, what I'm focusing on is people using neural networks and, for example, training them and using thing, you know, things like the early stopping or Adam, where you don't really know what kind of local optimum the optimization method has found. Uh, so these are the points that I'm making, and that's why I focus on trained 
networks and trying to exercise those trained networks to see whether you know they actually do what they are supposed to do but the other point i completely agree and you know the limitations of scalability as well all right very good and i take the opportunity to uh, relay uh, another question also from René Vidal. And this is, uh, what is the rationale behind having one player select features and the other select pixels? Also in the MNIST example, images are binary. What does it mean selecting a feature in that context? Uh, okay, yes. So a feature is a group of pixels um uh and the reason that we want to focus to so to have one player focusing on features is to speed up the search so the idea is that if you focus on the salient features you are more likely and more you are, you are more likely to quickly find the most dangerous adversarial examples. So a feature in this case is a group of pixels, and this is what the whatever uh, feature extraction algorithm, I have used SIFT in that case, but you can use other feature extraction algorithms. Uh, and then that's why searching a pixel within the feature uh, will allow you, you know, to target the pixels uh, rather than, for example, doing a systematic search in a highly dimensional space of pixels. All right, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, as I was just saying, the um, safety verification, you know, where I look at stability or, you know, uh, what I call invariance of, of the decision in a small region, uh, this is a very weak property. Uh, uh, because, and I've also considered robustness just to simple manipulations. So, you know, pixel changes, for example, or word substitutions. Uh, but we know that in machine learning, uh, the decisions are subject also to distributional shifts. Uh, so if you train your, um, uh, autonomous car in California, and then you want to take it to London, you know, under the gray skies, we know that the distribution will be very different, and we need to be able to uh, explore that shift in the distribution. And for uh, this work, what we have done is we have uh, focused on causal Bayesian networks, and this is an example of a of an insurance uh, Bayesian network, uh, which encodes the causality extracted uh, from the data. And my question is, if this is my environment, that's the data generated process, and now I have a decision not shown here, the decision F, which is a machine learning process trained in some way which uses the random variables you know from that environment can i show can i just study the robustness of that decision function under causal interventions um okay, sorry yeah. uh, and uh, this uh, has led us to the definition of interventional robustness which is defined as the worst case performance of my decision. And worst case is then um, uh, computed by bounding the worst case probability in terms of lower and upper bounds uh, before uh, with respect to changes in the environment. So on the left, I'm showing you changes to the parameters. And in those changes, for example, you can explore just the changes in the conditional distributions. So the changes in the 
probability tables. But on the right, uh, what I'm sharing you is an uh, exploration of changes, changes to causal assumptions. So what happens if by, you know, the, the shift in the environment would change the causal downstream links between the random variables? And for this uh, definition of the problem, um, what we have done is, okay, so one thing I should note uh, here is that on there, I've, I'm showing you the node F, but I'm not showing you what that F stands for, but this is the decision plus the environment. What I do is I can, uh, assuming that, you know, I work with certain classes of machine learning models, I can encode them as arithmetic circuits. So I can encode the decision and the environment as a large arithmetic circuit, and I can uh, develop algorithms that compute upper bounds and lower bounds on the probability values. So basically what this is allowing me to do is to consider to what extent the various probabilities change as you change the environment in those particular ways. You either change the probabilities or you change the um, causality. So that's one, but of course the uh, so the main point also very close to my heart because I have been working on probabilistic um, verification for many years now is that requiring um, that no adversarial examples exist is too strict. Uh, and in fact, uh, all we can do because the world is stochastic is to bound that probability by some very small value. Um, so what we need to do for that, we need to generalize to probabilistic guarantees, not just deterministic guarantees. And we want to take account of the learning process in that. Um, and a vehicle that uh, does it quite naturally is a combination of neural networks with Bayesian learning where you assume that uh, you take a neural network, but it is a neural network that has a prior on the weights. Um, uh, uh, and uh, then you train in terms of computing the posterior probability in the Bayesian way. And uh, the, the network then returns not just the classification, but also how certain or uncertain the network is about that classification. Um, and for this, what I do is, as you remember before, uh, when I was defining my safety in terms of point-wise robustness, uh, I was saying that there cannot exist a point Y which classifies differently from X. Now what I'm saying that the probability of such a point existing in the region is small and bounded from above, uh, uh, you know, by uh, a, a value epsilon, which is, you know, some threshold parameter. Now that probability is also conditioned on the training data. So if I change uh, the training data, you know, I, uh, I can adapt this statement to the training data. And for that, we have developed uh, two methods, one based on sampling, which using what we call statistical model checking and another one uh, is a, a numerical approximation, lower bound probability computation. And in this method, we can take a Bayesian neural network um, and we compute 
probabilistic safety of outputs, given you your input is in a certain region, so probabilistic safety, so meaning the probability that the output will be in some set, given the input is in some other set. And in this case, we combine the method with interval bound propagation, where for conventional neural networks, you propagate the intervals through the network, and that gives you bounds on the output. But here I also have to uh, consider intervals in the weight space and combine the two in order to compute the probability through sampling. And also similarly for linear band propagation. We have also used it to quantify uncertainty for a Bayesian neural network uh, controller. So this is showing that it, you, the method also works for regression uh, problems. Um, so this was trained on um, images uh, from the uh, CALA simulator, which you see there on the left. And we studied uh, the various problems such as the obstacle problem and susceptibility to weather conditions. What I'm showing you in the middle is actually how the probability of uh, the maneuver being safe depends on the different uh, variational inference used. So HMC, for example, uh, has the highest value. So this exposes the differences between the network, the same network, but trained using different methods, okay? Trained networks. Before you put it in your car, you can evaluate it using these methods. Okay, so just to summarize, I mean, there is, uh, much excitement about AI deployment. Uh, and, you know, I'm also one of those people who is excited about it, but I'm trying to push towards uh, methodologies that can be uh, used to develop safer, uh, better performing models. Why? Because there have already been quite a few high profile failures that you know about and quite, quite a few and high profile and also high cost uh, failures that in future we would like to avoid. Uh, but, you know, of course, uh, um, I think I'm only scratching at the surface of the problem. We are still very, very very early on in um, uh, understanding and in particular understanding the uh, Bayesian, you know, probabilistic uh, 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 verification in the context of machine learning. And there is much more progress needed. And I'm here using an example that we also need to extend the probabilistic models to cognitive models that uh, uh, can be combined, you know, with, for example, autonomous driving controllers to obtain more human-like uh, behaviors. And for that, we also need strategic uh, robustness, not just adversarial and distributional robustness that I mentioned. So as my conclusion, well, uh, I'm, you know, my point is that uh, we do need to worry about safety. And we do need to critically evaluate uh, whether a particular methodology can actually be deployed in practice. And I've given you a brief overview of uh, my work and my group's work in this context, which is still very early on. Uh, and what we do need to consider uh, in future is more complex properties. Um, not just stability in the region. Uh, I've mentioned distributional robustness, but also strategic robustness, so robustness to say certain strategic behavior of the user, also correct by construction synthesis and how we can combine logic, you know, how we can work with neuro symbolic models 
um, uh, to actually uh, combine the best of both worlds, you know, the, the kind of the, uh, uh, you know, training uh, approach, but also the hard constraints that logic provides. And I will finish with acknowledgements. So thank you. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Professor uh, Kvyatovske. Uh, so I, I, I just recall, uh, if you have any question, you know, please you know, post it on uh, the Q&A tab uh, on Zoom. And, but I'll get started by relaying uh, two questions uh, that are here. So I've got uh, time for uh, a couple of them. So the first one is by uh, Leonid uh, Chin Belovich. And uh, it reads, uh, you mentioned that you assume that the perturbations have a group structure on them. Can you please elaborate a little bit about the group structure uh, you meant in that statement? You know, whether it's a group from group theory or simply a collection of new black points. Yeah, so I meant a group structure in the sense of group theory. Uh, so what I was really trying to say is, you know, just focusing on bounding perturbations is not good enough. I think what we need to consider is a class of allowable perturbations. And if you think of images, things like, you know, the change of camera angle or lighting, they can be expressed in terms of operations that often form a group or semi-group of some sort. All right, very good, thank you. Um, and finally, there's uh, another question by an uh, anonymous uh, attendee. Uh, and this is, how does having knowing uh, bounds help us avoiding adversarial attacks? <laughs> that's right, that, no, it's a, that's, a, that's a good question, but also goes beyond, you know, what, uh, uh, what I can do, okay? So, uh, my starting point is a trained neural network. Um, and then I want to compute, say, the maximal safe radius. Now, what the maximal safe radius then gives you is the maximum perturbation that can be tolerated, okay, on that decision, you know, on the, on the critical support for the decision. Of course, it's, you know, it, it uh, doesn't help with avoiding adversarial attacks. It just helps you that, say, if you provide a way to prevent attacks up to a certain perturbation budget, the one that's, that's, uh, you know, bounded by the maximum safe radius, uh, then you will be fine. Right, very good. And uh, I'll relay one final question and then uh, uh, we will uh, switch speakers. And uh, this remark is again by uh, René Vidal. And it reads, uh, computing uh, Lipschitz uh, constants for large networks is very hard. Approximate procedures are more efficient but overly conservative. Likewise, MC, uh, MC like methods can have very high variance in very high dimensional spaces. So the yeah. question is how do we address those challenges to verification of deep networks? Yeah, okay. So for the first one, computing Lipschitz constant, yes, it is very hard. Notice that I do not need to have a precise Lipschitz constant. I need to have an upper bound. Uh, uh, but the if it is a very loose upper bound, my method becomes uh, computationally inefficient because I just have to do verification on a finer grid. I think we really need uh, better methods, but I think to be honest, I'm not sure we need to be looking for better methods to estimate Lipschitz constants for more and more complex networks. Uh, what I would say is we need to have methods that can guarantee uh, the training so that the training weights are less than one. 
then I will not have a problem. So if you could give me a methodology, something like Parseval networks, then this problem becomes a lot easier to deal with. Uh, of course, maybe people will, could come up with some, you know, very clever methods to estimate estimate good ellipsoid bounds. Um, but I think at this stage with neural networks, we are where we were with go to programming. You know, there is a reason for go to better, better efficiency. Um, but there are also reasons against using go to and work with more structured programming. Um, and of course, that's the, you know, the cost of testing and the you know potential failures so i think with neural networks in particular what we need is we need a methodology somewhat similar to the methodology that exists in control theory where you know you have guarantees that if you work with this kind of parameter you, you, if you want that kind of you know stability that's what you need to do and this is what theory uh, gives you. So I'm kind of, I'm arguing for that kind of methodology. And for MCMC, again, I, I don't, I think I don't develop MCMC. Um, but yeah, you know, again, I, I agree with you. But I think here, what I would say is, rather than trying to adapt MCMC directly, um, by working with these very high dimensional spaces, we really need to work with some kind of dimensionality reduction. Uh, and I think there are, you know, already approaches of this kind from, you know, based on wavelets from Stefan Muller. Um, if we have, if we know of some theoretical guarantees, some theoretical constructions that allow us to reduce the dimensionality. My method was rather ad hoc. It just points, points out the fact that you can do it, but we need a principled way to reduce dimensionality, and then this problem becomes simpler. 